Hello and welcome to Scientific American's Best of the Blogs for May 2013. What a month for science and media. Not all the stories were good, mind you, but wow, some of the top posts from the network this month are all about the intersection between media, advertising, and science. First up is a post by Patrick Mustaine on the guest blog, all about the advertising strategies used in the food industry. Dear consumers, in 2011, a group of nutrition experts released a report that recommended how we, the food industry, should regulate ourselves when marketing food to children. The report said foods marketed to children should provide a meaningful contribution to a healthful diet. Unfortunately, these guidelines would exclude 90% of the products we produce. If everyone started eating the way these guys want, we would lose $503 billion per year. We don't really want you to be unhealthy, but it's way more profitable to sell you foods that aren't that good for you. Besides. We don't like to think that there's evidence that eating too much leads to obesity. In fact, one of the studies we funded found that childhood obesity is not related to added sugars in the diet. Anyway, ads don't make people eat badly. We don't influence your decisions. You might ask then, why did we spend $1.6 billion on advertising just to children and adolescents in 2006? Well, we do what we want with our money. So please, keep it coming, and we'll keep feeding you fatty, sugary, and starchy foods. Sincerely, the food industry. I'm afraid the news doesn't get much better from here. Let me throw it over to David Wogan at Unplugged, who brings us some scientific insight behind an interesting set of videos about fracking. If someone told you that your favorite coffee shop might go up in flames because the pipeline is carrying fracked natural gas, you would be alarmed, right? Well, that was a message in a video posted by an environmental campaign titled, In Case You Missed It, A Seriously Scary Thing Is Scheduled To Happen To New York City This November. But the seriously scary thing is how the campaign uses fear tactics and misinformation to obscure an already emotional and highly politicized issue. The video raises questions like an explosion in the West Village and radon in my apartment. As I mentioned in my post, these are actually separate issues. A pipeline is not more likely to explode because it contains gas from a fracking well. Hydraulic fracturing is one method to extract gas from geologic formations. Pipeline safety is indeed a serious concern but not any more so because of fracking. And finally, keep in mind that New York City already has miles of natural gas pipelines transporting billions of cubic feet of gas each day. In fact, there is a vast network of natural gas pipelines across the United States, including the Northeastern US. Okay, so the media news and science this month wasn't all bad. Danielle Lee over at Urban Scientist brings us a really cool story about how the media helped to change a situation that really needed to be changed. Danielle, what have you got? On April 22nd, Florida High School junior Kira Wilmot decided to pretest her science experiment that she was going to present to her biology school teacher. The test included mixing a wad of aluminum foil with the works toilet bowl cleaner, which chemically is hydrochloric acid. What resulted was a pop, an explosion, her being arrested, and charged by the state attorney with two felony counts as an adult of endangering other people's lives, essentially discharging a weapon on her school grounds. The entire scientific community became upset because we recognized that a lot of us made very similar, very stupid <laughs> mistakes when we were kids, but we weren't arrested for it. And many of us were actually mentored and guided through these foolish experiments and found our own ramp to science as a result. We're hoping that's what happens with Kara. We're very thankful that everyone decided to participate and talk about all the things that we either blew up or ripped apart and people contributed to her legal fund and there are now people contributing to her and her sister's space camp fund. So thanks to Dr. Homer Hickam, yes that Homer Hickam of the Rocket Boys, has decided to send Kara off to space camp and with everyone else's donations her twin sister will be able to join her as well. From here we go over to Kyle Hill who had an interesting post all about the benefits of having science shows in popular media like Mythbusters. When I first saw the Mythbusters, I was 14 years old. I couldn't do much of anything, but the Mythbusters told me, taught me that I could do science. I could take this nerdy, geeky dis disposition that was just a part of my life, and I could use science to apply that to all the things that I love, whether that be bugs or engineering or math or any of these things. It didn't just show me, it showed an entire generation of kids that this was an okay way to be. You didn't always have to get everything exactly right. Mythbusters, I don't think, was ever about getting the science perfectly peer-reviewed correct. It was about showing that there's a worldview out there 
that explores the world a little bit more closely than other ways. And to see recognition from them and from readers was a revelation to me that you could be this nerdy geek and love the world and explore. And that could be as always there's a ton of amazing science covered on our blog network this month we have a cool story coming at you from Sci curious or i should say bethany brookshar because she actually came out from her pseudonym this month and she's given us a cool story about how the characteristics of a voice have a lot to do with how we react to that voice Sci curious over to you Sci curious here in the famous book, The Great Gatsby, by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is now a new movie, um, you will surely recall that Daisy Buchanan, the lead female, has a beautiful voice. I just want to take one of those little pink clouds up there, and put you on it, and push you around. But what is it that makes her voice so beautiful? So to find this out, Zhu and colleagues in a recent paper in PLOS One had a group of men and women listen to a male or a female voice uh, recording the phrase, good luck on your exams. She recorded the phrase in a high breathy voice, a medium regular voice, or a low hard voice. And various aspects of it were used as men rated the attractiveness of the voice that they heard. Rather unsurprisingly, men tended to prefer a high, breathy voice, while lower, flatter voices were late rated as less attractive. When the, the roles were rever reversed and women were rating men, the women rated the men with lower voices as being more attractive, but they also actually liked breathiness. Zhu and colleagues conclude that voices might be considered a secondary sex characteristic, something from which you can conclude the attractiveness of a potential partner. I don't know about that. I think that culture might have a big role to play in it. The next time you hear a beautiful voice, think to yourself, what makes it so pretty? Those were some of my favorite stories from the Scientific American blog network this May 2013. I will be back in June with more stories. And of course, in the meantime, keep checking out all of your favorite blogs on our network. There is just so much cool science covered each and every day. I will see you in June.